Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. I was telling Renee the other day that I felt like Bilbo Baggins going through the airport, like making sure every few steps that I still had my dongle with me. So I made it uh, successfully. I still have my software, and it's uh, very good to be here with all of you guys. Um, so our project right now is Atsuka Pharmaceuticals. Is They sell Abilify. It's the number one grossing drug in the United States. It's a schizophrenia and depression drug. And and their patent's running out. And so they are projected to lose about 75% of their $6 billion revenue a year. Um, lose 75% of that within the next year. And so they have all of this latent expertise about mental health care, and they're not quite sure what to do with that. Uh, and so they are building a care coordination tool in partnership with IBM to say, okay, well, we don't have this revenue from our great medication anymore. What else can we do with our expertise? And so they're partnering with IBM to build a care coordination tool uh, to help integrate and, and make healthcare, mental health care in the United States smarter. And so what, they're, what we're building is a, if, a, if a, mental, a mentally ill person gets arrested one month and goes to a homeless shelter the next month and goes to an emergency room the next month, none of, right now none of those three entities talk to each other. Uh, they don't know what medications the person's on. They don't know emergency contacts or uh, therapies they're on. They don't, none of those three entities share information. And so we're building a tool to help uh, take care of the most severely and persistently mentally ill uh, with a more integrated care approach. Uh, of course, only with consent. Uh, and so the definition of severely and persistently mentally ill is a person with schizophrenia, uh, major depression, or bipolar. Uh, that's the definition of SPMI that I'll use for the rest of this talk. Uh, and so the way AnyLogic comes into this project is we use AnyLogic mostly as a sales tool. Uh, when we were gathering requirements for this care coordination tool, we went around with the, the software engineers, and they, when they were mapping out how to integrate all these healthcare systems, they... Uh, they gathered requirements, and we use those requirements to make an AnyLogic simulation of a major metropolitan area. Uh, so we could simulate what was going on in the real world, and then, and then we could use that to find bottlenecks that the so uh, a good piece of software would address, and also use that to simulate other potential places we could sell this to and say, okay, here's what we think your mental health care uh, network looks like in your city, here's where we think software could help or, or where good care coordination software could help. Uh, and then we can simulate that and say, here's your ROI and, and things like that. So it's a very uh, beautiful way to sell because you can show somebody that you understand what's going on. Uh, so what I'm, I'm not going to show you that today. I can talk to you about it in the appendix. I have some screenshots. But uh, oftentimes with modeling, we found that when sometimes you'll do such a great job and make it so realistic with the real world that it becomes just as complicated as the real world. And so you lose the insight you had because, because your model is just as complicated as something you couldn't understand in the real world. Uh, so what I've done here is, is very, abstr very much abstracted the more detailed simulation that we built uh, to give you more insight about a very powerful underlying mechanism. Uh, so very much in the way that the shelling segregation model, which is one of the examples in uh, the AnyLogic uh, library, uh, a very abstract way to help you guys understand a very powerful underlying mechanism in America's mental health care uh, system. So what I'm going to recreate for you in a, in a generative way, uh, Joshua Epstein is one of my favorite Asian-based modeling authors. He talks about generative social science. Uh, he talks about bottom-up rules to recreate macro phenomenon. Uh, and so that's what I'm going to do today for you guys, uh, in more specifically housing situations. How do mentally ill people live, and how has that changed over the last 50 years or so? Uh, Dorothea Dix is a famous American social worker. In the late 1800s, she worked to get mentally ill people out of prisons. Uh, mentally ill people were living largely in prisons uh, because there was no way to help them. There was no psychotherapeutic drugs, uh, and oftentimes mentally ill, uh, mental illness was seen as a moral failing. And so uh, if you commit a crime, it's a, a moral failing no matter what, and 
uh, and let's just put these people in prison. And so Dorothea Dix found that rather than punish these people in the justice system, what they really need is help. And so she was very influential in getting those people into state mental hospitals instead of prisons. Uh, and then in the 1950s, the first psychotherapeutic drugs were found, and this was a huge deal. Um, and, and what happened then is there was a series of legislative changes in response to these drugs, uh, saying we need to get these people in community-based care rather than in state hospitals. And so uh, Kennedy, John F. Kennedy was very big in this, and then a series of academic studies uh, attacking mental hospitals were also published. Uh, one of my favorites was a guy named David Rosenhand where he had his graduate students admitted to a state hospital and then they acted totally normally. They didn't act mentally ill at all because they weren't, uh, but the, the state hospital wouldn't let these people leave. Uh, they, they confined healthy people and so he had to go and rescue his students uh, to get them out. And so state hospitals were a big step up from prisons, but they weren't perfect. And so they had, uh, they confined too many people and they were too large. And so uh, with the, the advent of psychotherapeutic medications and uh, some other community-based care initiatives that JFK uh, was a big proponent of, um, that started to change. And so you'll see the teal line in the bottom is in the 1950s about 25% of all severely and persistently mentally ill people in the US were living in state hospitals. Uh, and today, it's, it's less than 3%. So that's a huge change in the last six years, or uh, 60 years, I should say. And, um, and so what happened is these legislative changes put an artificial ceiling on how many people could be in state hospitals. They pushed that down and said, we need to put these people in community-based care uh, and give them medication that can make them uh, successful participants in the larger society. Uh, and then a few other, th uh, a few of the other smaller types of housing situations for SPMI people also changed. Uh, and on the margins, the people who don't react very well to medication and who aren't very responsive to other types of therapies. Uh, those people very, like, very lately have ended up in prisons. Uh, so right back to the problem that Dorothea Dix solved 100 years ago. Uh, we're back to that point. If you don't respond to medications in community-based care, but there's an artificial ceiling on how many people can live in hospitals, state hospitals, because we've legislated them down, their funding down. Uh, where do these people go? Uh, and right now they're going to prisons. And so... IBM and Atsuka were partnering to try and say, uh, how can we help these people? If, if their medications is not working uh, and, and there's no pipeline, there's no immediate hope for these people that the medications will work better in the near future, can we use technology to help them instead? And, uh, and so that's the point of our care coordination tool. Uh, so this is a slide just uh, a brief summary of major, major changes in the last 150 years or so. Um, the Community Mental Health Care Act in 1963 was Kennedy's legislation, largely in response to the advent of chlorpromazine, uh, which was uh, seen as the, the, the next big hope for SPMI people, and, and largely it was. If you see back here, how many more people with SPMI are living in the community now? It, it's, a, it's a big change. Um, but again, the green bar, the, the one on the bottom, uh, there's still problems. There's still people living in jails and prisons because there's nowhere else for them to go. Uh, and very predictable problems. Again, prisons, which I've mentioned, rehospitalizations, people are cycling through, going to the ER just to get medication, uh, homelessness if there's nowhere they can go, if they can't afford a house uh, or anywhere to stay. And so these are very consistent system-wide problems. Uh, and these people cycle through. They cycle through over and over again through these very expensive ways uh, to get care. So uh, Peter Earley is a, a former Times Magazine journalist, and his son has schizophrenia. And so he, when his son had these problems, he wrote an account, a very uh, uh, vivid account of his struggles and his son's struggles to get care. And and, uh, and one of the most powerful passages in his book is that the largest public mental health 
hospital in, the, in America is not actually a hospital. It's the Los Angeles County Jail. Uh, on any given day, it houses an estimated 3,000 mentally disturbed in my, inmates. Uh, Cook County Jail in Chicago is another uh, large mental health institution in the United States. Um, and so, the, the, and now we'll get into modeling this in an abstract way. Uh, Peter Early, in one of the parts of his book, talks about uh, when people with mental illness have symptom flare-ups, we call them mental health crises. When they have this in a prison, uh, what happens is that the prison keeps them for longer, right? Uh, if you throw a punch at a prison guard, the, the prison will file charges against you, new charges, and it'll extend your length of stay. Uh, same thing in the hospital with the Rosenhan study, right? Even healthy people were kept. Imagine if these people were acting up over and over. It extends their length, and stay, length of stay longer and longer. But imagine that same punch being thrown in an apartment building or in a homeless shelter. They're not going to keep the person longer. They're going to kick them out. They're going to say, you can't stay here. We're, we're evicting you. you. You can't live here. And so what happens is there's a reinforcing effect in certain housing situations. And in other housing situations, they kick them out. And so these people cycle through faster and faster through some, and they sink and pool in others. And those are long-term hospitals. The ones they stay in are long-term hospitals and prisons. But if you put an artificial cap on how many people can live in long-term hospitals, the only place left for them is prisons. And that's what's happening today. So in any logic, uh, in a, uh, we modeled this with a, a rate variable. right? We uh, say every time you have a mental health crisis, let's just add to their length of stay uh, with uh, their baseline rate of length of stay for each housing type. Uh, some are longer than others. And then let's add a, an exponential distribution times that baseline length of stay. And so it's just an approximation for what happens when people have mental health crises in each of these situations. So it's an addition if it's a long-term hospital or a prison, and it's a subtraction if it's in any of the other ones, such as community hospital, um, assisted living facility, et cetera. We also talk about uh, time to crisis, baseline time to crisis. And so uh, in our m more complicated model that we're building for and using with clients, uh, these are dynamic for each agent, for each SPMI agent. Uh, if they're taking therapies, their mental health condition goes up and their time to crisis increases. But for the sake of this model, it's static. And so uh, the, the least healthy people, they'll have a, a mental health relapse every 10 days or so, maybe 25 days. And the healthiest people are up towards 365, as they only have very infrequent mental health relapses. So that's the second abstraction we use for our model. And then the third is what I've been describing about housing for the last few minutes. Uh, people stay in certain certain living situations and then they leave and they go to a decision point and they say, okay, where am I going to go next? Am I going to go to a homeless shelter, a private, uh, a private residence, maybe with some family? Uh, but what happens here is the, the thickness of the line just is a visual explanation for um, people pooling in certain places and long-term hospitals just not accepting anybody because there's, there's no room. And so this is the effect that I'm going to show in an agent-based way. Uh, what happens when we have this, when we have this mechanism in our society? What happens to people, and, and what types of people pool in each of these living situations? So let's go to the left model. So this is uh, an agent-based way of showing that cycle, right? That housing decision cycle, and and there's baseline rates for at the decision point where do they go? Uh, there's randomness there. And then the length of stay is a baseline length of stay dependent on what type of place it is. Uh, so private residents have a, length of, a baseline length of stay of one year. Uh, community hospitals are much shorter because those are the ERs. Uh, homeless shelters are more like a month, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and the bottom here is the, the percentages of each type of housing situation. Where are people living? Um, the biggest one, and this is a, more of a model warm-up time that we're in right now. So I'll speed this up. Uh, but what, what you'll see is that as long-term health legislation gets passed, 
uh, that's the teal one. And there, there becomes this artificial ceiling on how many people can go to long-term hospitals. And so where do people go? Uh, you'll, you saw the graph as my second slide, but now can we recreate that graph with these simple rules? Um, and you'll see that the teal will stop, start dropping as long-term health legislation is passed, and the gray will become more common. But one of the important things to notice is underneath each, underneath each group is the, the group's average time to crisis. Uh, so that's a measure of how healthy are these people. The longer, the longer the average time to crisis or mental health relapse, the healthier they are. And, and you'll see that it becomes very different for each housing type because the least healthy people start to pool in these places that keep them when they have crisis versus kick them out. Um, so right now, long-term hospitals and jails and prisons have the worst people. And then uh, what happens is that jails or prisons tend to keep more and more people over time and then uh, it's, it tends to be the worse off people. Uh, so that's, an in, that's one of the major intuitions we've gained from the larger simulation model that we've built for our clients uh, in these different states. And, um, and again, it's a, I, I wanted to be able to show you guys the intuition behind that because sometimes when we have too complicated of a model, uh, it's, it's hard to see what's really going on. Uh, and then we've also modeled in little things like uh, ODH, Atsuka Digital Health, is what our software product is called. And so can we, um, if we boost the worst off people's time to crisis, where do these mentally ill people tend to go? And then, again, it's, it spreads out more like these baseline rates. Rather than people pooling in long-term hospitals and prisons, uh, they spread back out into the wider world. Uh, so it's, it's exactly what we want, right? It's an intuitive way to explain the effect of boosting people's health. Um, so that's it. And um, yeah. so the implications of this are very small reinforcing effects have a major impact on our larger society. Um, and as a, as, a, as a race or as a country, we have a, a choice between we can increase people's health we can house them in prisons, or we can pay to increase back the capacity of long-term hospitals. And that's a choice that, that we face, and we don't, really have a, we don't really have an option besides making people healthier or housing them in one of these two places. And I can, if you guys are curious, or um, if any of you ask questions, I also have screenshots of the more complicated model that we built. Um, some of the some of how some of the problems we handled were also talked about uh, by other teams here, such as um, getting large many a large number of parameters in the model. We used Excel for that, and then macros to push it out to CSVs. Uh, any logic batch file would read in those CSVs and then spit it back out to a file, and then um, we did all of the data analysis in Excel again, so users could easily change parameters in Excel and not have to worry about. Um, tweaking anything in any logic. Everything was Excel based and then macros in Excel called the batch files. Um, so there's definitely technology problems that I can talk with about uh, with all of you, but um, really my point today was to give you that intuition about mental health in the US. So, um, so that's it and thank you all very much. So. I saw that in at least one state, they are continuing the prescription for, for mental health medicine after they leave as sort of a free benefit of being a prisoner. Um, hmm. Is that something that, that you've seen and taken into account? And if, it, if you have, what kind of effect did it have? So the idea would be that if you continue the medication for free, they would have a longer relapse period Right. And, uh, and perhaps, you know, be able to make a better outcome for themselves. Generally with Medicaid and Medicare and other funding sources, the issue generally with these most severely mentally ill people is not paying for medications. They can go to an ER and get free medication generally. Uh, Medicaid, Medicare will pay for it. The hospital generally is not denying these people the drugs they need. It's, it's more of a that they don't want to or they don't like the side effects. Um, 
so you're right, these people need meds and it's, it's a great thing the prisons are doing, but that's generally not the issue that we've found. Uh, so I have two quick questions. So uh, first, what data did you collect and how do you use it in the model? And the mm. second thing, when I was looking at the numbers in the model, uh, being a homeless actually makes their time to crisis longer. So I'm, I'm interested to know maybe being a homeless is a good thing for them. So Not that it makes it longer. It's uh, it's not that it makes it longer. The time to crises were static for all these people, uh, for all these agents in the model. So it's, n it's, n it's not that. It's that the people with mental illness were pooling in prisons instead of homeless. And so uh, generally that's the, the intuitive explanation for that is that people who are worst off act up and have problems, and so they get uh, taken off the streets by... Uh, policemen. And so actually to stay successfully independent and live on the street, maybe you're not quite as worse off as the people who get taken off the street and put into prisons. That would be the intuitive explanation for that. Yeah. We, have, we have one more question. Uh, I had some information. I want to know a little detail in the agents that you built. For mm. example, like as someone else had mentioned, you alluded to, uh, did you model the likelihood someone was going to take their medication or and that kind of thing? Oh, and I mean, and other facts that uh, how difficult was it to model these people's like states? Sure. So uh, I'll, I have some slides in the. Can you um, can you show the PowerPoint again, please? So part of the whole IBM project with this was going around with uh, and interviewing policemen and hospital administrators and social workers, and that was a it was a huge long process to model people's likelihood of taking their medications, of ending up in jail, and uh, et cetera. Um, so over, over 40, hours, uh, of inter uh, 40, 40 hours of observations, 100 interviews, uh, 16 weeks of just gathering requirements with our software engineers. Um, so, so yes, we've done all of that. And, uh, and then we broke it down. These are all the parameters, or many of the parameters we collected, and then broke down all of the system, ways people interact with the mental health care system. We broke that down into um, really PowerPoint state charts and then put it into any logic. Um, so yes, yeah, so we've, we've gone through all of that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.